So with that said, back to the US dollar, and I'm going to actually read a few things, not long. Both of them are very short. The first will be a report, March 8th. So this has been talked about ever since these sanctions came into play, okay? So ever since the sanctions came, sanctions came into play and the gas prices started rising in the Europe, right? is so worried, right? The whole capitalist economy is worried about the long-term effects of this. The short-term gains, great, right? There's a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> among fossil fuels, among military contractors for these sanctions because sanction sanctioning Russia creates ample opportunities to monopolize the energy market. And also, what does the military industrial complex rely on? Energy. So they love that these weapons systems and military aid is being increased. And of course, the military contractors love that because it's their weapons that are being sold at egregious prices to Ukraine's government, which I'm sure will help also bankrupt Ukraine, as has been the case since 2014. But nonetheless, this is March 8th, and Reuters was already reporting that uh, Credit Suisse's Pozar says commodities crisis could weaken the euro dollar and boost the yuan, which is the RMB, the currency in China. So they said that China's central bank is uniquely placed to backstop a global commodities crisis sparked by sanctions imposed in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, potentially paving the way for a much stronger yuan, a Credit Suisse investment strategist said. In a note published on Monday, Zoltan Pozar, global head of the bank's short-term interest rate strategy, said the unfolding crisis in Ukraine led to a perfect storm in commodities that could weaken the euro dollar system, contribute to inflation in Western economies, and threaten financial stability. This crisis is not like anything we have seen since President Nixon took the U.S. dollar off gold in 1971, the end of the era of commodity-based money. When the crisis and war is over, the U.S. dollar would should be much weaker. The uh, RMB, the RMB, much stronger, backed by a basket of commodities. Russia's invasion, the biggest attack on a European state since World War II, has nah, let's not has created 1.7 million refugees, fears of wider conflict. Okay, I, can we can we redact that? It's not the biggest attack on a European state since World War II mainly because Europe is not, I mean, Ukraine is not considered European and whatever happened to Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia is technically in Eastern Europe and was destroyed to a much greater degree, believe it or not, but believe it because in 1999, NATO's bombing devastated tens of thousands mass there were refugees but it was mainly like a mass it was a mass killing and a destruction of the society but anyway i digress so the conflict has driven surges in commodity prices including nickel prices to a record high and oil to a 14-year peak russia has warned a ban on russia oil imports could jolt the cost of a barrel to 300 dollars so that's what you have you have russian commodities today are like subprime collateralized debt obligations were in 2008 Non-Russian commodities are like U.S. Treasury secretaries back in 2008, one collapsing in price, the other surging in price, with margin calls on both regardless of which side you are on. Western central banks held back by sanctions imposed by their governments will not be able to provide support such as emergency liquidity needed to close market gaps, he said, noting that the People's Bank of China faced no such restrictions. So there you have it. They're not going to close the market gaps because, well, they don't actually say why. Oh, they say because they're held back by sanctions imposed by their own government. So there you have it. These sanctions are so counterproductive that they won't allow European, European economies to relieve the situation. And that's because they're really cutting off such major parts of the global economy that this is the limitations of capitalism. It's the limitations of imperialism, really. You can only divide the world so much. You can only monopolize the world so much, the world economy so much, until you reach this limit, this end point, where now something needs to change, to transform, to reverse course. But of course, if we know anything about 
capitalism, it doesn't really have the capacity to reverse course. It just continues to develop as it is designed to do. It does not go backward. It does not say, okay, we need to go back to an industrialized economy. No, that's because the inherent character of the for-profit motive of the motive of private property prevents it from doing so, right? Because any reverse means that you got to give back. And that's not the principle or the design of capitalism. And that's why you see these crises continue to happen. So here you have that, you know, the US, the U.S. and European economies are not really structured to ensure that commodities can be controlled, the prices can be controlled despite the sanctions. And he said that selling U.S. treasuries to fund vessel leasing and purchases of cheap Russian commodities would help the People's Bank of China control inflation in China while leading to commodity shortages, recessions, and higher yields in Western economies. So basically what he is saying is that China will continue to economically do business with Russia. And so it can, through its own currency, bypass the limitations of the U.S. dollar by just buying the goods <laughs> in RMB. I mean, it's as simple as that in so many ways, but of course, the impact of this is huge. And so the birth of the euro renminbi market in China's first real break step to break the hegemony of the euro dollar market, that's what this person is saying, that it, this would be a break in the U.S. dollar and its domination of Europe. And the inflationary trend for the West means less demand for long-term treasury. So yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just obvious, right? The higher the prices get, the less people are going to buy. The less people buy, the more that the capitalist market is glutted, overstuffed, and the more likely you're going to get an economic crisis. And so that's what you have here. You have the United States precipitating this. And I just want to say thank you to uh, Nurse Hemp. Appreciate it. Unfortunately, YouTube takes all of these super chats, I turn them on, they take them all for the first hundred dollars and then they take a huge percentage. So if you do can divert those super chats into Patreon, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong, you know, even just, just divide it up like $1 a month, $2 a month It's so much better, but I appreciate, I appreciate all of the support nonetheless. So I want to get into a few other developments with this. So the move to the dollar is also being content the move to the rmb is being contemplated by saudi arabia a country that is long known as a deep partner of the united states there is multi tens of billions hundreds of billions of dollars that have been uh, transacted over <laughs> there's been there have been exchanged over the years in the form of oil for weapons essentially right saudi arabia has the oil the us dollar is pegged to oil and this has been lucrative Saudi Arabia gives them just extreme leverage over the purchase sale and distribution of their oil their massive oil resources and the United States gets to have this monopoly on that as well you know and to control the price and to do all sorts of things and so this relationship is very very lucrative and is really at the heart of the US dollar's strength in a lot of ways. And so that's why the United States supports Saudi Arabia to the degree that it does. It literally funds and militarizes Saudi Arabia to the teeth to keep its extremely brutal regime. I mean, we're talking about a political system in Saudi Arabia, a monarchy, which beheaded 81 people in a single day within the last week or week and a half or so. So it's a brutal regime. It's nothing like a quote unquote Western style democracy, but it is one that is extremely important to the United States. And so you have, let me share the screen again. You have Saudi Arabia contemplating 
the selling of its oil to China in RMB instead of US dollars. So this isn't the first time that this has been contemplated, but it really does matter, right? For all the things that I just said, it pegs its oil to the dollar. So any damage to the dollar would hurt its own, its own currency to the dollar, would hurt its own currency. But if China can supply RMB instead and buy it directly, it may be more beneficial for Saudi Arabia with its bilateral relationship with China, which isn't really said in this article. But nonetheless, you know, this goes over a little bit about the history. You hear see the composition of official ex foreign exchange reserves. Of course, the US dollar dominates $7.1 trillion of all foreign exchange foreign exchange reserves and you have euros a lot less and now you just I, that's what that's you know the yuan is now fourth fifth which is significant given china's overall economic position over the last several decades rising but still underdeveloped but nonetheless there is this contemplation right of saudi arabia potentially using the RMB instead of the dollar for its trade in oil to China, that would be big, right? It says the effect on both China would be in US would be profound. To observe the new role of the RMB, China would have to ensure political stability and financial transparency. I mean, this is ridiculous of the kind that US the US promised in the 20th century. That's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> I don't know if that's that's just an assumption. That's what the Western media always does. They're talking about what if the RMB replaced the dollar. That's not really on the way. But even this contemplation of Saudi Arabia potentially doing this in the bilateral relation does spell, I think, an overall trajectory of the dollar's decline. So political stability, does China have a problem with that? Not really. Financial transparency, I mean, what does that even mean, right? Does it mean that it opens its books like i i don't i don't understand that but i don't really i don't think we should worry about it either the us's ability to issue dollar debt and earn dollars for exports would decline so its economy would shrink obviously if the dollar was replaced in this situation the dollar's weakening may trigger a vicious cycle capital flight away from the dollar and towards the rmb debilitating the dollar further so that's what they're worried about this vicious cycle and it's an important one to note in that the more that countries decide to trade in their own currencies, the more that the threat that the U.S. dollar weakens and weakens to the point where perhaps global South countries won't feel dependent upon it anymore. And that would trigger not only a global economic crisis, but likely would trigger the military crisis that I tend to be a little bit more concerned about. I tend to think that before there is going to be really an economic transformation in the global system, world system, that there's going to be a, a massive conflict. Because if I know anything about capitalism and imperialism, is that it doesn't just bow down. So the threat to the dollar is serious in the sense that it could be the trigger for the U.S. to do the unthinkable, right? Because it's kind of like the last act of desperation of this system right and that is on the way and now it's not tomorrow right because us dollar is still very dominant you saw that chart us dollar is still very dominant but it's weakening and i think what we're seeing is that the more that the us becomes aggressive toward russia toward china the more that it actually pushes itself out of its own sphere of influence because China has things that the U.S. can't offer. Russia has certain things that the U.S. can't offer. But really, it's China that has the stability, has the economic growth, has the technological capacity and know-how, has a financial system that isn't dominated by Wall Street, and can do things that are far more generous, far more beneficial and cooperative than the United States. So in a sense, developing countries, underdeveloped countries, global south countries, which is the vast majority of the world, even Europe would be remiss to miss out on these opportunities. And that's part of this Russia-Ukraine crisis is also about isolating China and preventing this 
dollar dominance from receding because China is much stronger in Europe than it ever has been. It is the top trading partner of Europe and it has many countries, right? I think more than a uh, more than a half dozen countries in the Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> so Europe does not want to lose access to the Chinese market nor the Russian market, but the United States, right, has such a deep control politically and economically has such a deep influence over Europe, right? Europe is the junior partner of U.S. imperialism, and so hands are tied. The puppet, the puppets are being played by the puppet master, and that's what's happening. So I want to share an article by Pepe Escobar. And while I do, uh, please do like the stream, right? Because this is a really good article, and you don't want to miss it. So like the stream. Please share the stream. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the notifications bell. And I really do encourage in lieu of like super chats. Once, once, once we get you know through this period of YouTube taking everything, then maybe I'll encourage it a bit more. But uh, please do subscribe at whatever amount at patreoncom Haifong. That's the best way to support this channel and this work. And so. Okay, I'm going to share this article because it's from Pepe Escobar, geopolitical analyst, who is very good on this particular subject, which is the fall of the U.S. dollar. And he wrote this article just a few days ago, published it a few days ago, and it's titled, Say Hello to Russian Gold and Chinese Petro Yuan. The Russia-led Eurasia Economic Union and China just agreed to design the mechanism for an independent financial and monetary system that would bypass dollar transactions. So there you have it. This, this, the mechanisms are coming into place. While we're not there yet, these countries are, are moving. They're moving and shaking. They're not standing still and waiting for the United States to destroy them. That's just not going to happen. That's part of the, why this multipolar world is developing. They're not going to wait. For the United States to collapse and do the unthinkable, right? These military assaults, the militarization, all of it, the sanctions, all of it is an, a deep threat to their very existence. So Pepe says, this is a short article, so I'll probably read it in full. It says, it was a long time coming, but finally, some key alignments of the multipolar world's new foundations are being revealed. On Friday, after a video conference meeting, the Eurasian Economic Union and China agreed to design the mechanism for an independent international and financial, uh, international monetary and financial system. The EAEU consists of Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, and Armenia, is establishing free trade deals with other Eurasian nations and is progressively interconnecting with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. So a lot of these countries, Russia, Belarus, right? Two out of the five are part of the sanctions regime from the United States being targeted, right? Belarus, there was a color revolution in 2020 that the United States supported through the NED and other forces to try to overthrow Lukashenko and the government there. And it is also being targeted in this Russia-Ukraine crisis as the enemy. And so it's being economically strangled as well as Russia. You have Kazakhstan, which is also part of this overall geopolitical crisis that the United States has helped shape. That country has faced political calamity even within the last six months. We saw uh, those protests that turned violent. And of course, you have Kyrgyzstan and Armenia already in pretty weak economic conditions. So this Eurasian Economic Union makes a lot of sense, and it's led by Russia and includes hope what they hope will be a growing sphere of East Europe and Eurasia. So for all practical purposes, the idea comes from Sergei Glazyev, Russia's foremost independent economist, a former advisor to Vladimir Putin and Minister for Integration and Macroeconomics for the Eurasia Economic Commission, the regulatory body of the EAEU. Glazyev's central role is devising new Russian and Eurasian economic financial strategy has been examined here. He saw Western, he saw the Western financial squeeze on Moscow coming to light, coming light years before others. 
Quite diplomatically, Glaziev attributed the fruition of the idea to the common challenges and risks associated with the global economic slowdown and restrictive measures against the EAEU and states and China. Translation, as China is as much a Eurasian power as Russia, they need to coordinate their strategies to bypass the unipolar U.S. system. The Eurasian system will be based on a new international currency, most probably with the yuan as reference, calculated as an index of the national currencies of the participating countries, as well as commodity prices. The first draft will be ready to be dis- will be already discussed by the end of the month. The Eurasian system is bound to become a serious alternative to the U.S. dollar, as the EAEU may attract not only nations that have joined BRI, Kazakhstan, for instance, is a member of both but also the leading players in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, as well as Aishan. West Asian actors, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, will inevitably be interested. In the medium long term, the spread of the new system will translate into the weakening of the Bretton Woods system, which is even serious U.S. market players, strategists admit, is rotten from the inside. The U.S. dollar and imperial hegemony are facing stormy seas. So we're going to continue, but I think that's just very astute, right? This is, this is a trend that we have to pay attention to. The Eurasian Economic Union, it's something that I have been following since the Obama era and the Belt and Road Initiative, right? They, they formed relatively during the same time period as Russia and China were getting closer together. They have a lot of commonalities regionally, of course. They have different focuses, of course, right? Eurasia. And China is is not as broad as China's Belt and Road Initiative. The EAEU did not have the same kind of expansive ideas for infrastructure development, but roughly the the aim is the same. It's about integration. It's about developing these economies which have been so underdeveloped in the post-Soviet era. It's about reducing dependency on Europe and the United States while also trying to connect to those markets. It isn't a hostile act, so to speak. A lot of it is just about strengthening economic development through trade networks and through the development of the infrastructure needed to conduct trade, whether that's railways, whether that's pipelines, right? And so we all know if you follow Pepe Escobar that he is big on the pipeline circuit. He talks about pipelinistan. He talks about how through these post-Soviet republics and Russia and China, there's a lot of pipeline activity happening to try to subvert and circumvent dependency on oil and gas from outside and to try to integrate which makes a lot of sense, trying to integrate these resources that each country has, these economic development opportunities that each country possesses into a full-fledged global trade network. And that makes a lot of sense, right? You shouldn't have to ship, you shouldn't have to ship oil and gas from far-flung parts of the world when you have it right underneath you. You should you shouldn't have to spend all sorts of money uh in in your trade relations with other countries when there's infrastructure that could be built to both shorten the time that it takes to get commodities across and certain raw materials and resources across with your own neighbors right and that that's that's what's been stripped from a lot of underdeveloped and post so-called colonial nations neo-colonial nations what's been stripped of them is the opportunity to really develop their economies in a sovereign way in league with their neighbors because they have been dominated by European, U.S. financial institutions, dominated financial institutions, and they have been dependent upon imperialism to develop their economies, which has impoverished them and led them to economic catastrophe. And so these integration networks and trade agreements, etc., do threaten the continued viability of that, lab, right? This Western dominated imperialist order. If these countries can figure it out together, then there is more of a risk for the United States that, yeah, the dollar and all these other dependencies are dropped, but the dollar being a huge one that really, I think, brings it all together. 
So show me that frozen gold. Meanwhile, Russia has a serious problem to tackle. This past weekend, Finance Minister Anton uh, Silonov, I really can't speak Russian, uh, Silonov confirmed that half of Russia's gold and foreign reserves have been frozen by unilateral sanctions. It boggles the mind that Russia's financial experts have placed a great deal of the nation's wealth where it can be easily accessed and even confiscated by the empire of lies. At first, it was not exactly clear what he meant. How could the central bank's uh, Elvira <laughs> Nibulina and her team let half of foreign reserves and even gold be stored in Western banks and or vaults? Or is this a sneaky diversionist tactic by Solonov? No one is better equipped to answer these questions than the, ines than the inestimable Michael Hudson, the author of the revised version of Super Imperialism, the Economic Strategy of the, Econ of the American Empire. Hudson was quite frank. When I first heard the word frozen, I thought this meant that Russia was not going to expend its precious gold reserves on supporting the ruble, trying to fight against a Soros-style raid from the West. But now the word frozen seems to have meant that Russia had sent it abroad, outside of its control. It looks like, at least as of last June, all Russian gold was kept in Russia itself. At the same time, it would have been natural to have kept security and bank deposits in the United States and Britain because that is where most intervention in world foreign exchange markets occur, Hudson added. Essentially, it's still up in the air. My first reading assumed that Russia must be doing something smart. If it was smart to move gold abroad, perhaps it was doing what other central banks do, lend it to speculators for an interest payment or fee. Until Russia tells the world where its gold was put and why we can't fathom it, was it the Bank of England even after England confiscated Venezuela's gold? Was it the New York Fed even after the Fed confiscated Afghanistan's reserves? So far, there are no extra clarification either from either of them. Scenarios swirl about in a string of deportations in northern Siberia for national treason. Hudson adds important elements to the puzzle. If the reserves are frozen, why is Russia paying interest on its foreign debt failing, falling due? It can direct the freezer to pay to shift the blame for default. It can talk about Chase Manhattan's freezing of Iran's bank account, from which Iran sought to pay interest on its dollar-dominated debt. It can insist that any payments by NATO countries be settled in advance by physical gold. Or it can land paratroopers on the Bank of England and recover gold, sort of like Goldfinger at Fort Knox. What is important is for Russia to explain what happened and how it was attacked as a warning to other countries. So... As a clincher, Hudson could not but wink at Glaziev. Maybe Russia should appoint a non-pro-Westerner at the central bank. I mean, you know, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing that Russia is in an economic predicament and it can't explain to the public why, maybe because Russia's economy is still very much dominated by Western finance. That was the post-Soviet arrangement. That was what led to the catastrophe that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so we have to also understand that while Russia's economy had a lot of sovereign aspects to it, and to the credit of United Russia and Vladimir Putin, there were moves to ensure that the worst excesses of the oligarchic control of the economy and the wholesale just uh, theft of assets was stopped. It looks like there were still there's still problems, and that is what capitalism does. That's why that's the difference between China and most of the world, right? Most of the world, unfortunately, in some respect, whether it is a neo-colonial arrangement, whether it is this kind of situation that Russia is in, where it's a multipolar rising power, but still caught in between. Regardless, capitalism has its problems and it seems like Russia, we don't know, but Michael Hudson really makes the case, and maybe I should have him on the program, makes the case that there's a whole lot of things that could have happened, and maybe it was lending it out to speculators for interest. Maybe it was moving the gold abro abroad because that's just that was just a more convenient thing to do, cheaper, more return. It's hard to say. So we'll see. Maybe it'll come out later. So it's tempting to read into Russian Foreign Ministry Sergei Lavrov's word at the diplomatic summit in uh, Antalya last Thursday as a veiled admission that Moscow may not 
have been totally prepared for the heavy financial artillery deployed by the Americans. We will solve the problem and the solution will be to no longer depend on our Western partners, be it governments or companies that are acting as tools of Western political aggression against Russia instead of pursuing the interests of their businesses. We will make sure that we never again find ourselves in a similar situation and that neither some Uncle Sam or anybody else can make decisions aimed at destroying our economy. We will find a way to eliminate this dependence. We should have done it long ago. Some so long ago starts now, and one of its planks will be the Eurasian financial system. Meanwhile, the market, as in the American speculative casino, has judged, according to self-made oracles, that Russia's gold reserves, the ones that stayed in Russia, cannot support the ruble. That's not the issue on several levels. The self-made oracles brainwashed for decades believe that the hegemon dictates what the market does. That's mere propaganda. The crucial fact is that in the new emerging paradigm, NATO nations amount to, at best, 15% of the world's population. Russia won't be forced to practice autarky because it does not need to. Most of the world, as we've seen represented in the hefty non-sanctioning nation list, is ready to do business with Moscow. Iran has shown how to do it. Persian Gulf traders confirmed to the cradle that Iran is selling no less than 3 million barrels of oil a day now with no sign with no sign to JPCOA. Oil is relabeled, smuggled, and transferred from tankers in the dead of night. Another example is the Indian Oil Corporation, a huge refiner, just brought, bought 3 million barrels of Russian urals from trader Vit, uh, Vital for delivery in May. There are no sanctions on Russian oil, at least not yet. So there you go. You know, you have this development, right, where countries are saying that they're going to keep trading with Russia. Washington's reductionist McKinderisk plan to manipulate Ukraine as a disposable pawn to go scorch earth on Russia and then hit China. So essentially a divide and rule to smash not only one, not one, but two peers in Eurasia who are advancing in lockstep as comprehensive strategic partners. As Hudson sees it, China is, the cross, is in the crosshairs and what happened to Russia is a dress rehearsal for what can happen to China. Best to break sooner than later under these conditions because the leverage is highest now. All the blather about crashing Russian markets, ending foreign investment, destroying the ruble, a full trade embargo, expelling Russia from the community of nations, and so forth. That's for the zombified galleries. Iran has been dealing with the same thing for decades and has survived. For four decades and has survived. Historical poetic justice, as Lavard intimated, now happens to rule that Russia and Iran are about to sign a very important agreement, which may likely be an equivalent to the Iran-China strategic partnership. The three main knowns of Eurasia integration are perfecting their interaction on the go, and sooner rather than later, maybe utilizing a new independent monetary and financial system. But there's more poetic justice on the way, revolving around the ultimate game changer, and it could come sooner than we all thought. Saudi Arabia is, accept is considering accepting Chinese yuan, not the U.S. dollars, for selling oil China. Translation, Beijing told Riyadh, this is the new groove. The end of the petrodollar is at hand, and that is the certified nail in the coffin of the indispensable hegemon. Meanwhile, there's a mystery to be solved. Where is that frozen Russian gold? So, I mean, that's just a very good article. I think I reached 200 viewers just re a, a while ago, but I'm not going to even get into that. Just keep liking the stream. Keep subscribing to the channel. Keep supporting the work. Patreon.com slash Danny Haifam. But that was a very good article. That article, essentially, from Pepe Escobar, lays it all out. Russia is not going to be isolated in the way that Washington thinks it is. This is the problem with U.S. imperialist hegemony. The U.S. really does think that it is the ruler of the world, that it rules the world and dominates the world and anything that it says goes. And that's just not the case anymore. The multipolar world is here. And that has huge economic ramifications, as he laid out so eloquently and so briefly and so concisely the whole idea of isolating russia this huge country huge energy producer is even more ridiculous than even trying to isolate an iran right which is a smaller country but resource rich nonetheless and there's another element to this that Pepe Escobar doesn't generally talk about, and that is political will and struggle. That is the class struggle, because everything we're talking about with imperialism, the dollar, all of it leads to a class struggle. And if you understand Lenin, you understand 
the theory of imperialism and understand what imperialism is. Under the stage of imperialism, the struggle between nations becomes a class struggle. And that is where we're at. And so this class struggle is intensifying. And these countries that are being targeted by imperialism are building and developing stronger and stronger relationships because one, first of all, that is just beneficial to them because the U.S. and Europe are certainly not offering handsome deals even just at the economic realm, right? Not even at the core kind of baseline economic realm. There's not anything really incredible coming down the road for the global south as a whole for underdeveloped countries and countries with experiences of colonialism and underdevelopment. So there's that fact, right? That's just independent of militarism. But then you add the bullyism, the sanctions, the hegemonism, you add that into the equation and it, it just accelerates everything. And so this is very characteristic of imperialism. Imperialism is built on these kind of contradictions, right? It, it the more it grows in attempts to assert dominance actually the more it digs its own grave so it'll be really interesting to see how things develop here because this monetary system created by the eurasian economic union could certainly bring just i think a whole lot of flexibility to the world situation it could give countries, these smaller countries in that region, so much more room to breathe. And of course, with China at the center, China's prominence in the development of Eurasia would only skyrocket. Its influence would only skyrocket, given that it is the most successful, it is the most highly developed, it is the uh, most stable of any country in the region and arguably the world, right? This is the high advantage that China has. And so this is a class struggle in the sense that the United States is at war, is in a class war with these countries, and it is bringing that war to a head. It is bringing that war to a very climactic position, which is still developing, right? We still don't know how it's going to play out, but we know that, I said it before, that Russia has opportunities that the United States underestimates and Europe underestimates because they don't want to publicly acknowledge that the deck that they have in their hands is not as solid as they say.